What are you doing? Okay, seriously, guys. Don't be like this person. Don't do this. Don't do this. It's time to learn about parries. Hi, my name is Rust. I'm an Elden Ring content creator with an emphasis on PvP. Parries are a fun, high-risk, high-reward tech used to get a massive amount of damage on your opponent and punish their aggression. The purpose of this video is to supply you with the tools and information to get reliable and successful parries based on specific setups and interactions, even on terrible latency. Now, full disclosure, I've never bothered learning how to parry until recently. I reached out to the Coop, who agreed to mentor me. Coop is a streamer on Twitch and has a growing channel here on YouTube, and he's incredibly consistent at landing parries. Anyone can throw one out there and get lucky, but Coop has made a science out of parrying, and I wanted to learn what he had to offer. Please go support his content, sub to his channel, and give him a follow over on Twitch. This is going to be a pretty lengthy video, so there will be timestamps in the description to help you reference parts of the video if you're looking for something specific. This video is going to cover a number of different topics, including an overview, comparing each of the parries, parry frames versus parryable frames, angle check, reaction parries, setup parries or prediction parries, hard swaps versus soft swaps, strengths and weaknesses of parries, and a showcase where I'll be covering the principles covered in the video. If you enjoy the video, be sure to like and subscribe, and let me know down in the comments if you found the information helpful at all or what I can do to improve in the future. The technical aspect of parries is very complicated. Parries have 2-6 to six active parry frames from frame 5 to 11. Weapon parries like daggers and curse swords only have 2 active frames from 7 to 9, and are generally less reliable, but damn do you look cool when you land one. Of all the available parries, carrying retaliation has the best coverage, being from frame 5 to 11, and has the added benefit of absorbing magic and some ashes of war, and converting them into a phalanx over your head. Golden Parry has the unique property of an extended hitbox that can parry from a greater distance, but has a fairly short window from frame 5 to 8. Stormwall reflects projectiles from regular bows and fan daggers, but just blocking a projectile will nullify its damage, so trying to parry one is kind of a wasted effort. There are plenty of options like Thop's Barrier, which can cause a projectile to redirect, but all the other options are just worse than the ones already mentioned. Overall, Carrying Retaliation is arguably the best with its ability to convert spells into a phalanx, but Golden Parry has the unique property of the extended hitbox, which is far more valuable than it may first appear. You see, landing a parry isn't so simple as trying to react to your opponent's attack. Parries work on a one-sided confirmation, but unlike every other interaction in the game, the confirmation is only on the side of the person being parried. This means that if you go for a parry that lands perfectly on your screen, if you have high latency to your opponent, then the parry won't land, because they will see your attempted parry come out too late. On top of that, there's an additional condition that must be met in order for the parry to be successful. Everyone always likes to talk about parry frames, but nobody ever talks about parryable frames. There's a number of different weapons and attacks that are simply unparryable, but every attack from a parryable weapon may only have one or two active parryable frames of its attack, generally being the first active frame of the hitbox. So for example, a halberd running R1 only has parryable frames on the first two frames of its attack, and for the following two frames afterwards, it's unparryable. So if your opponent is able to space their attack to hit with only the maximum range of the weapon, then it will never be parried no matter how tight your timing is. But that's what makes Golden Parry so valuable. Since it can parry from a distance, you can parry the Halberd at its max range, since the parry is able to connect with the first frame of the active hitbox. For weapons with a sweeping hitbox, they have a much easier time avoiding getting parried by unlocking and changing the angle from which they swing at the opponent. If the opponent is right up in your face, then dead angling doesn't always work, because if the hand is within the active hitbox of the parry property itself, then the parry will connect as long as it's making contact with that first active frame. In summary, if you want to avoid being parried, then you either need to use weapons or ashes of war that are unparryable, including things like two-handed colossal swords, whips, flails, and the ashes of war like the first part of flaming strike or lion's claw. But what's really interesting is that if you put a parryable ash of war on an unparryable weapon, then it allows that weapon to be parryable, such as giant hunt on a colossal sword. The last condition that needs to be met in order for a parry to be successful depends on an angle check. When you activate a parry, the game locks your position of your feet for the full duration and prevents rotation. At the time that this occurs, if you aren't facing within 53 degrees of your opponent, then the parry will fail. In Elden Ring, the force parry check seems to be synonymous with the normal parry check, and it doesn't allow for omnidirectional parries, the way that it did back in Dark Souls 3. I've heard theories that Golden Parry is capable of this, but in all my testing we were never able to reproduce this result. Trying to raw parry an attack without any data on the latency that you have to your opponent is an easy way to get yourself killed. Partial parry will occur if the attempt was either too early or too late, 
So trying to figure out whether your parry was either early or late can be a little hard to judge if you don't have other information. You can get a good read on your connection with someone by timing how long it takes between missing an attack and when a phantom hit occurs. I use an app from Nexus Mods called Steam P2P Info, which reads my connection to my opponent and tells me on an overlay what my latency to that opponent is. This is nice because not only does it tell me the latency, but I can see who I'm connecting to before I even join their game. Some things are more reactable than others, and if you have a read on your connection to someone, they're pretty safe to go for. Reaction parries take a lot of practice to learn how to adapt to various latencies and to identify the right frame to start your parry on, but even with all that practice in the world, it, they just aren't that reliable. Setup parries are the answer to all of your parry related problems. That is, unless you're the one being parried, in which case, get wrecked idiot. Setup parries are done by creating a specific encounter and making a prediction that your opponent will respond to it in a specific way. There's a ton of ways to set this up, and I'm going to cover some of the more reliable ones. But before we do, there's an important concept that I need to briefly cover, which is known as damage levels. A damage level refers to the type of stun inflicted. Each weapon class is assigned a damage level stun of 1 to 3. Anything with a damage level 1 stun will be referred to as a small weapon like threshing swords, straight swords, or katanas. Anything with a damage level 2 stun will be referred to as great weapons, such as halberds and great swords. And anything with a damage level 3 stun will be referred to as colossal weapons. When interacting with these different damage level stuns, it will change the timing of the parry input to either be immediate or delayed to the first frame of movement. One of the more common things that you'll see in a fight are chained roll catches, where the aggressor makes the prediction that their opponent will panic roll and timing their attack to roll catch on that specific timing. The timing for a panic roll catch is the same no matter what weapon that you're using, and will usually come from doing like an R1 to an R2, R1 to a running attack, crouch attack, or some other variation, all of which rely on similar timings. You can punish your opponent's attempt to go for a roll catch by going for a parry directly out of hit stun. This is the least safe and most punishable type of parry that you can go for and is dependent on the latency that you have with your opponent. As an example, you can consistently parry a Great Lance R1 out of hit stun at 50 milliseconds of latency, but it is impossible to do at 170 milliseconds of latency. I really only recommend going for this type of parry if your opponent seems to have one singular game plan in mind that they don't seem to ever deviate from. The timings are subtly different depending on the matchup, but if your opponent rolls in on your attack, receives a phantom hit, meaning that they rolled less than perfectly, then you have plenty of room to go for a parry. Basically, as long as your latency is under 200 milliseconds, then it's pretty reasonable that you'll land the parry if you go for it immediately. If they roll an R1 of something like a greatsword and avoid the phantom hit, then you can parry immediately. If they get phantom hit, then you can delay your parry to the first frame that you can move. You can go for a parry after rolling their attack to catch the follow-up. This is latency dependent and is mostly consistent if you can roll early enough to not get phantom hit. It works differently depending on the weapon. Things like Shamshir and Straight Swords have incredibly fast backswings on their R1, and your roll has to be timed perfectly to get the parry. With other things like Claymore, your follow-up is perfectly slow enough for you to be able to parry out of the roll. If you're locked on, then your character won't immediately pivot out of the roll to face your opponent. And if you aren't facing your opponent out of the roll within 53 degrees, then the parry will fail, no matter how good the timing is. To combat this, if you unlock from your opponent and hold the direction stick to face them, then you can correct the angle out of the roll to land the parry successfully. Golden Parry is excellent for this because you can land the parry after rolling away from your opponent, which keeps the angle consistent with the opponent so you don't have to worry about unlocking. If your opponent likes to mash their way out of hit stun, then you can use it as an opportunity to punish their mash with a solid 1700 damage parry repost. It's probably the most satisfying way to say, fuck off and respect my priority. The timing for the parry is pretty consistent, and you need a delay to the first frame that you can take a step to go for the parry. If you trade with your opponent, then you can line up a very easy parry if they mash out a hit stun. When you block an attack, it causes your shield to lock up and prevents you from making any action. This is actually a good thing, and you can use it to set up a parry. Against small weapons, you can parry immediately out of shield lock to get a confirm, or against medium weapons, you want to delay until the first frame movement. I generally wouldn't risk this against a Colossal for fear of being guard broken. Shield poking to this day is still one of the strongest setups available. This was showcased recently by Omega who put out a very detailed video explaining what makes shield poking so strong, even now after the substantial nerfs to shield poking. But what's interesting is that you can use the mechanic of shield poking itself to set yourself up for a parry. If the opponent hasn't initiated the poke and simply blocks your attack, doesn't consume much of their stamina, and it sets them up to get punished by any follow-up attempts that they make with a shield poke of their own. If you mash parry out of putting them into the shield lock, then the timing works out perfectly to parry the following shield poke.
card swap parries are something that we often see some of our favorite content creators doing where they equip a shield into their main hand out of the menu, land a parry, and then swap back to a high crit damage value weapon. Other than looking sexy as fuck, there's a lot of merits to this, being that you can further optimize your build without sacrificing points into equip load to support the extra weight of the equipment. There's a specific scenario where hard parries work best, and that's when the opponent has a habit of rolling away out of hit stun and then immediately going for an attack out of their roll. This provides a perfect window for you to do a hard swap without them even realizing what happened. These are very high risk, and it's easy to get yourself menu locked, causing a prompt to appear on your screen that you have to click out of before you can do anything else, likely ruining your swap and potentially getting you killed. It's much safer and more reliable to simply swap swap to a shield, or already have one in your hand to avoid the risk of getting menu locked. If you're dead set on going for a hard swap parry, you need to wait until the window that your character is able to take a step forward, hold the forward input, open the menu, select your main hand weapon, and then use your left or right trigger to quickly swap to your shield, close the menu with start button, get your parry, continue to hold forward, open your menu back up, go to your main weapons, swap to your reposting weapon using left or right triggers again, and then hit the start to quickly leave the menu and get your repost. Just showing your opponent that a parry shield exists can cause them to change their playstyle quite dramatically and force them to think twice before going for an attack. But probably the best thing that a parry shield provides is force priority out of a trade. On high latency, trades are almost unavoidable, and it comes to a contest of who's more alpha in the relationship and mashes R1 harder. But with parries, you can assert your dominance with your superior L2 button and put them in their place. Parries have a few glaring flaws about them, the most obvious being the risk of getting a partial parry or missing the window altogether, getting punished, and losing whatever priority that you might have had. You're generally giving up the opportunity to maintain priority by predicting your opponent to attack into you. If they do literally anything other than the thing that you're setting them up for, then you lose your advantage. From this point in the video, I'll be showcasing a number of these different types of parries, and you can see my progress as I quite literally went from never doing parries to now feeling very confident with them thanks to my mentorship from Coop. Again, please go check out his content, I'd really appreciate it if you could support my friend. So in deciding on what weapons I wanted to use for this video, I wanted to use something that has a consistent poise break on the main hand weapon so that it can function well on its own. This is so that I could have a shield in my offhand for a good number of fights, so I threw on a dex build and went with the greatsword and curved greatswords. We get a nice R1, L1, R1 pseudo combo, followed by the R2 roll catch, which they decide to roll in on, and immediately we note that they like to attack out of the roll, which is perfect for us to set up a parry. Now here, I make the mistake of not putting my opponent into hit stun before going for the swap, and once again, I'm looking for that opportunity to put them into hit stun, swap the shield, and then go for the parry on predicting the rolling attack. And here we're able to land that perfectly, and end up getting the regular roll catch to finish the fight. Next up, we see a base grade hammer shad. These things are perfect for me to start with my process of learning how to hard swap parry, and I'm starting to get a little bit more warmed up, feeling more confident in my movement and remembering how to play the video game. And I actually genuinely enjoyed fighting this opponent, not just because of the, you know, the silly hammer, but actually because they played quite well with it, and there were some funny interactions that I really enjoyed. We see one of those here as I, we both whiff our jump attacks, and I just kind of stand there looking around like, what the hell just happened? They huddle down over to a corner, so I go and huddle down with them to see what they're up to, and we proceed to again try and desperately hit each other. Now, you see me do this crouch attack with the Curved Greatsword a lot, which is quite fast, but its tracking leaves must be desired, often sinking down into the floor, causing it to miss. So you'll see me unlock and angle my camera upwards into the sky, and try and get the hitbox higher. They go for their Ash of War, and I honestly don't even know really what it does, but the roll timing on it is super late, but they looked like they were excited to use it, so... That was pretty cool. <laughs> I waited out, and they gave me a little weapon shake as if to say that they're having fun. Now, my opponent isn't really mashing out a hit stun at all, they seem pretty sensible with their plays, so I feel confident going for a hard swap parry here, and I get it set up by getting them out of hit stun, swapping over to the shield, roll the JR1, punish the follow up, but once again, I mini lock myself and wallow in my shame. My opponent's a good sporter about it and pulls me back up to my feet, and we give each other a little shake, finishing the fight with a lucky anti air, followed by a roll catch and delay jumping attack. So this dude does on some kind of shonen anime protagonist arc, and he starts running around throwing fireballs everywhere, without really any logical thought process put into it. He then pulls out thrusting swords and starts charging at me, again, without much evidence of thought. Like, hey, this dude's holding a curved greatsword. Maybe charging headfirst into it with weapons that don't poise break is a good idea. 
We pull off the swap, get the parry, and finally successfully swap over back to a weapon. Not the right weapon, but I'll take it. And he still seems to have the game plan of holding forward and then rolling backwards. But I have the better R1 button, so I'm just going to hold forward back at him and clean up the fight. I swear, whatever kind of energy drink this guy was on, I, I want it. Please. Next up, my opponent is using Power Stance Pikes. Easily the strongest weapon setup in the game. And I bet you can't guess what Ash of War is on them. Go ahead, guess. You really won't get it. We get my opponent in the hits done, and I'm already in my menus getting ready for their response. And make a messy swap over and get the parry on their L1 out of Bloodhound Step and end the fight immediately. I didn't even bother hard swapping the weapon back over to the Mizio Accord. I just keep a soft swap Mizio Accord for the funny backstab things, so I swapped over to that to make sure that I don't fuck up. Now this fight, we're going to see my opponent is using a katana. At first, I can't really tell which one. I throw out a bait to see how they respond, and they empty jump toward me, delaying their attack for a roll catch, and I'm able to pluck them out of the air with a backswing. They're light rolling, so roll catching is going to be a pain, but they're actually playing really well. You never want to roll in on small weapons like Shamshir or katanas because their backswing is guaranteed to connect if you do. They go for a jump in and delay to try and roll catch with the running R2, and now I see my window of opportunity. I'm really going to have a hard time getting anywhere with this opponent who's playing very conservatively, only going for one or two hits, and then light rolling away back to safety. So they go for some funny back step thing, and I show my back to hopefully bait them in. I get into my menus, I see them go for the jump, and I predict the roll catch attempt. And once again, I forget to swap back down to Mizio Accord. I like to say that I actually get this right eventually, but spoilers, I suck. Okay, invasions. Now, it's a little secret that I tend to loathe invasions, and for the first hours of attempts, I feel like these were justified, as every single host either fogwalled or yeeted themselves off a cliff before I had a chance to fight them. Seriously, every single one. I almost gave up, but the coop was in my corner and urged me to press on, saying that it'll be worth it, trust, trust. So, I did. But I buff up, anticipating that I might get ganked. We see Mr. Redmay Knight come out of it with his Bloodhounds Fang, and we're pretty late into him, seeing that connect from pretty late. He goes for the Ash of War from pretty far away, so I soft swap to my parry shield, do a little spin, and take my win. But then the host of the world comes out, who's using a two-handed ultra. And you can't parry a two-handed Gugs, so I swap over to my dagger. And if you've seen my video on off-daggers, then you'll know that off-daggers have an incredibly strong matchup against Colossal Swords. So I found this fight to be really funny because it was a perfect example of the tech known as who does that? Which this guy has shown off in spades, going for the most random fully charged R2s I've ever seen in my life. But I know for a fact that if he lands it, then I can say goodbye to my entire health bar, so I have to play pretty safe. But luckily the off-dagger has enough speed and recovery that I can get my chip and dip without having to risk a punish. For the next invasion, I went down to level 90 because I couldn't find any worthwhile activity at meta. Just people base jumping off of Halig Tree or hotboxing in boss rooms. But here we have an invasion in some catacomb with a host and their phantom. They're camping the corner here and throwing rot pots, and the mage is getting a little bit greedy, so eventually I'm able to take advantage of it. I get the roll catches as they chase them down the hall, and the host comes running up from behind. Immediately try and mash out a hit stun, and I predict it and go for the parry to finish the invasion. I've got two phantoms and a host camping in grace, and one of the phantoms is actually sat down to make it very clear that they have no intention of moving. When people do this, it's great bowing time, and I start great bowing all over the place. I have my ping monitor on, and everyone in the world is showing up as being over 200 ping, but one of them is very unstable, fluctuating wildly, but I'm not really sure which one it is. With one of the three down, I feel a little bit more confident about aggressing the 2v1 situation, so I buff up and drive in. I need to test my connection to each of the players to see which one is lagging, so I'm going to be rolling literally everything until I figure out what the connections are. The host takes a really late hit, but I'm still not really sure who's the laggard, but the phantom goes for his funny spin thing and hits me from super far away, so now I'm thinking that it might be them. I get the phantom into a roll catch chain, but they aren't really fighting back, so I don't go for a parry. The host comes forward with half of his HP taken out by 1R1, so now I'm afraid to attack him and risk killing him prematurely. They both L2, and I effectively have infinite iframes in my rolls given how high our lat is, so I pretty much go out of that unharmed and finish off the Phantom. 
But then the host started sliding toward me, and my life flashes before my eyes. The dude literally went super sane when I killed his friend. I nearly died as a result of it, and he comes out with the L2, but I miss the parry because he's too far away. He walks up to me with no FP, and I throw out a parry, which connects so late that I literally get jump scared and rolled away from it. I've literally never seen a parry act like that before, and I still have no idea what the hell is happening on that dude's net. At this point though, I'm just curious to see if I can get my timings down to see how early I need to parry in order to get it to land. So I'm going to fish for it until I get it. Eventually I do get it and end the nightmare. Starting off with the first of the setup parries, my opponent starts off using Curved Greatsword, and we find out really quickly that I have a remarkable connection to them. It's like they're literally living inside my walls. We see that I'm able to roll their attack without receiving a phantom hit at all. We tend to go for rolling attacks pretty often, which is going to be pretty free to set parry on with this connection. But just as I start to formulate a plan in my head, they swap over to Claws, which in itself aren't really all that threatening, but of course they're running quick step on them. I miss my punish for the first quick step as they go for a second one that comes out for me too fast to be able to roll out of, and so now I'm annoyed. So I try and punish with the curved greatsword, which they're able to quick step through and get a free hit off. But they start to get into a pattern of alternating quick step and their attack, so I just have to wait out the quick step and then get my parry on the following attack. Genuinely, I think that if I didn't have the parry shield, then there would have been nothing that I could have done against this setup. Luckily, quick step was just nerfed in the patch 1.10. So I'm hoping that they'll be more manageable to deal with, but it's still too early to tell. Thankfully, they swap back over to Curved Greatsword after backpedaling for 9 years, as they try and collect what little thoughts that they had left rolling around that cranium. Damn, am I still tilted? <laughs> I am. <laughs> That's insane. Please, guys, stop using Quickstep. For the, like, the sake of my sanity. Okay, I got that off my chest. Moving on. Invasions. No, actually, here's the thing. I'm not mad at players. Well, I am. But not really. I'm disappointed. Sure, some people don't really understand why Quick Sound, Quick Hound Step, and Blend Hound Depth are game breaking, but I only have the game developers to blame. But for the people that know exactly how game breaking it is, you're better than that. Believe in your ability to rise above it and not crutch on Quick Step. And if you don't believe in yourself, then believe the me that believes in you. Thank you for listening to my TED Talk. Right, back to parries. So this guy mashes out a hit stun, so I parry it. That's pretty much all you gotta say about that one. GG. Next up, we see a Lil Bro running fist weapons. Now, unfortunately, these were nerfed a little while back, so the R2 Vortex sucks, but hopefully with the new patch, they'll actually be somewhat usable now. But we see my opponent swap off his helmet to reveal his true identity, being a fellow Lil Bro. I eat the R2, knowing that the next one is coming out immediately. I wait until my character is able to take a step forward, and then go for the parry, which lines up perfectly. I actually swapped to Miseogord this time, as I sense Coop seething in rage at the idea of me not swapping for the 15th time. I go for the Morgoth's Wake Up, get a little chip, and finish it off with a running attack. But up next we see my opponent running the infamous Ribera Bobera, but not just one, he's using two. He's on a totally different level for me. As we all know, Ribera Bobera is the strongest weapon in the game, and I am no match for its prowess, but luckily, and I mean luckily, we finish the fight in one shot with a riposte. For the next fight, my opponent is running a shield poke setup. I've seen this guy in the arena in the past, and I know he's actually pretty decent with it, and runs barricade shield on the fingerprint just to make it that much more frustrating to break through. So, the specific situation that I'm looking for is to line up a parry after putting my opponent into shield lock. This guy's experienced, and I need to bait him into this setup for it. I start off the fight very aggressive and try and get him conditioned to wanting to punish my aggression with some shield pokes. I do a nice neutral jump, knowing that I'll clear it if he mashes out a hit stun, and stare him dead in the eyes to prove a point. What point is that, you might ask? I don't know, but I like to do it a lot. I think it's funny. But now that I have him shield poking, I need to set up the shield lock, which means that I need to hit the shield before he has the chance to poke through it. I throw out a few attacks and finally get the shield lock that I'm looking for. I immediately go for the parry, which connects, and I take my repose to finish the fight. Now, I don't know what it is about great swords, but dudes just love mashing out a hit stun. Like, all the time. So I get my dagger ready, and the fight starts off with me getting fan daggered. He has the right idea, trying to break my shield talisman, so I don't really blame him. But he mashes, and then I parry the mash. You know, when I was putting this video together, I kept getting confused if it was the same clip that I showed a few fights ago, or if it was a different, but it's honestly hard to tell. 
And for the next fight, we see my opponent running Power Stance HTS, which, as I've said before, really isn't a worthwhile setup. Two-handed HTS is just always better, with better attacks and better poise damage. But this guy didn't seem to get the memo that HTS's crouch attacks were nerfed so bad that they literally became a meme, and repeatedly goes for them out of rules. I predict him to mash out of hit stun and go for a parry, but he just rolls away instead. He goes for a bellus, and I go in for the punish, which he rolls in on, and I get the parry to punish his rolling attack. And for the last fight, I really wanted to focus on the setup parry out of guarding. But my connection here was super latent with about 190 MS, and my opponent's very good. I fought him a number of times in the past, and he's always enjoyable. So we start off the fight trying to get a read on the opponent and to see how they're going to play. They generally don't respect the risk of the parry, though, and I try and get one off of a backswing off the halberd, but my attempt is late. But since it was a partial parry, my health wasn't impacted by the exchange. We go for some fancy spinny things, avoid the counter-aggression of my opponent, and fail to space out with the absolutely insane phantom range of that backswing. But we get a solid dead-angle jump in, miss our roll catch, and now the opponent's on the aggressive again. I block the first hit and land the parry on the second backswing. But that's going to do it for this video. Once again, go check out the Coop both over on Twitch and on YouTube. He puts out great content every single day, and I couldn't have done this video without his help. Thanks for sticking around to the end, and I'll catch you in the next one.